Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CMS Academic and Policy Symposium. This is our third and final panel titled The 2020 Election, an Administrative Agenda for Immigration and Refugee Reform. Today, CMS and the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School released a report on this topic titled Improving the U.S. Immigration System in the First Year of the Biden Administration. The link to that report is now available in the chat box on your screen. My name is Emma Winters and I'm the communications coordinator for the Center for Migration Studies. Um, before we formally get started with the panel, um, I just wanna go over a couple of housekeeping items so that you know how to participate. At any time during the panel, you can submit a question for the speakers to do so, type your question into the box below your viewing window. Given the large number of participants on today's call, the panelists will be able to answer some of your questions, but not all of them. However, you can contact CMS with any questions uh, you have for any of the panelists after the event. Um, so this panel will last around an hour and 15 minutes and we will be recording this session and we will share it with you all who registered for the event. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the moderator of this panel, Daniela Alulema. Good afternoon. My name is Daniela Alulema and I'm Director of Programs at the Center for Migration Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third and final session of the 2020 Academic and Policy Symposium. This panel will address the 2020 election, an administrative agenda for immigration and refugee reform. Given the results, um, announced over the weekend. Today we can discuss what the agenda on immigration and refugee policy of the Biden-Harris administration should look like, particularly focusing on what the incoming administration should seek to obtain through administrative action in its first year. We have with us four prominent immigration experts who will explore with us and with each other the effect that this recent election will have on the course of U.S. immigration and refugee policy. We will also explore the challenges that the Biden-Harris administration will face in enacting this agenda. We would need a lot more than an hour and 15 minutes to discuss the numerous anti-immigrant policies implemented by the Trump administration. So during the first part of the panel, we will discuss some of the most salient issues that impact immigrant and refugee communities. But we encourage our participants to submit their questions via the Q&A box. The panelists' biographies can be found online, but I'll briefly introduce them. Alex Elenikoff is university professor and director of the Zulberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School. Alex served as the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees from 2010 to 2015. Alex will speak today about refugee policy in the U.S. asylum system. Wendy Young is president of Kids in Need of Defense, and before that, she served as Chief Counsel on Immigration Policy in the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration for the late Senator Edward Kennedy. Wendy will discuss issues that impact children. Charles Wheeler directs the Training and Legal Support Section for the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, also known as CLINIC. Before that, Charles directed the National Immigra Immigration Law Center in Los Angeles. Charles will discuss legal immigration issues, including family-based immigration, public charge, and notices to appear. Donald Kerwin is executive director of the Center for Migration Studies. He previously directed clinic for 16 years and also served as vice president for programs at the Migration Policy Institute. He will discuss border enforcement and immigration detention. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to mention that the Zolberg Institute of Migration and Mobility and the Center for Migration Studies released a paper earlier today that outlines a number of reforms on immigration and refugee policy that should be prioritized by the Biden-Harris administration. The authors of the paper, Alex Alenikov and Don Kerwin, are with us today. So before we dive into our discussion, I would like to ask Don to tell us a little bit more about the paper. Don. Yes, thank you, Daniela. And let me start by thanking Alex and Catherine and the Zolberg Institute for partnering with us on this initiative. And thanks to the many experts in um, whose analysis and insights and recommendations inform the report. They're listed 
in the report itself, and two of them are with us today, Charles and Wendy. We began this initiative, believe it or not, about a year ago, and it was inspired by a talk by Alex at the same annual academic and policy event. Over the year, we organized a series of conversations with an evolving group of experts, produced briefing papers, some of them published, most of them not, and reviewed many drafts of this report. Along the way, we made a few strategic decisions on it. First, we decided to identify and propose executive or administrative actions that a new administration could take on its own, that is without Congress. And I think we made this decision in light of the difficulty of passing legislation, but also because of the Trump administration's extraordinary attacks on virtually every aspect of the US immigration and refugee protection, protection system for executive action. It really feels like decades ago, but not too long ago, candidate Trump and members of Congress were calling the Obama administration lawless and even tyrannical for creating the DACA program. Yet the Trump administration has used executive action in this area far more extensively and to greater effect than any other administration in recent memory or even distant memory. The Biden uh, administration reportedly plans to move quickly via administrative action on a number of immigration issues, including rescinding the travel bans, increasing the refugee admissions ceiling, ending the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, restoring DACA, halting construction of new wall, and reunifying families separated at the border. If it takes these steps, it will be off to a fast start. We also decided in this project that we needed to go beyond undoing the worst abuses of the Trump administration and to propose ways to improve the immigration system overall. The idea is that the system needed reform even before Trump. We also wanted our initiative to complement the various community-based processes devoted to thinking about an agenda for the new administration. We initially sought to identify 10 to 15 administrative actions that would be particularly impactful or that might be less thoroughly covered by others. As it turned out, we failed to stay within our limit. Our report makes 40 proposals in 12 thematic areas. One complication, which is squarely before the Biden administration, is that these issues need to be resolved in a variety of ways and can only be resolved on different timelines. One size definitely doesn't fit all. On some issues, it's simply a question of a federal agency issuing a new policy memorandum or throwing its weight behind an existing program or terminating a program or withdrawing a policy directive or a legal opinion. In other cases, there will need to be formal notice and comment rulemaking, which is time consuming. Other issues such as DACA's underlying validity are still before the courts. Some of the issues we identify, such as the need to change some aspects of the culture of the US enforcement agencies is likely to be a longer, more arduous process. Please read the report. It reduces every proposal to a sentence or two, which was extremely hard for us to do. We have a lot to say on these issues. And we also include some short background information and the rationale for our proposals in a paragraph or two each. So that's a outline of our report and let me turn it now back to Daniela. Thank you, Don. Um, so I would like to begin our conversation by asking each one of our panelists uh, to address a two part question. First, please tell us about the status quo. Um, as we're coming out of the Trump administration, where will the Biden administration need to pick up from when it comes to immigration and refugee policy? And second, what can the Biden administration do administratively in its first year, not only to reverse the Trump administration's policies, but to actually improve uh, the US immigration system? So I would like to ask Alex to get us started. Thanks, Daniela. And uh, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it was to work with CMS on producing uh, this report. Um, we went, as Don mentioned, we went through uh, many drafts um, uh, because these are complicated issues and the solutions are not uh, always obvious, but we hope we've come up with a document that really can be uh, actionable, as we say in the government, uh, put these into effect. Uh, I'll speak briefly about refugee and asylum issues. I think uh, these will be well known 
uh, uh, to many people um, on the webinar, uh, we know what's happened to refugee resettlement. Uh, the reduction from o o a goal of over 100,000 resettlement slots to now in this fiscal year, 15,000. It went down every year of the Trump administration. Um, and so we know that the goal here is to rebuild that uh, number, to restore the number. We, we notice in the report that about 98,000 is the average number of uh, admissions or authorizations per year. Something in that ballpark would make sense. Uh, but that's going to require additional appropriations as well from Congress. And most importantly, it's going to take rebuilding the resettlement system, which has been devastated uh, by these cuts. Without refugees coming, the voluntary organizations that resettle refugees uh, have had to cut staff and close offices. That all has to be rebuilt now. That can be rebuilt. These are these are organizations that know how to do that, but that will take time and that will take money to get us back to the place we should be in our traditional role as leaders of refugee resettlement around the world. Uh, on asylum, perhaps in no area has the Trump administration be, been more relentless than its attack on asylum seekers at the southwest border. Think of what the administration did. It threw the military at the border. It tried to build a wall. It, it threatened Mexico until Mexico started enforcing its south, southern border. It entered into agreements with the Central American states to take uh, asylum seekers. And then it ultimately pushed back uh, asylum seekers to Mexico to wait there for their uh, applications to be adjudicated. And then when, when COVID came, uh, relying on uh, COVID, uh, and really, I think, in a pretextual way, simply started expelling everyone who showed up at the border. And thousands of people, including undocumented, uh, I'm sorry, unaccompanied minors, uh, have been thrown back uh, at the border, where we really have no process, no asylum at the southwest border. On top of all that, the administration uh, announced uh, regulations that I have every belief they will finalize before uh, they leave office that significantly tighten standards uh, for um, uh, asylum seekers and makes just dozens of changes that, 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 that make the process just much more of an obstacle, of course, uh, to get through or one that can't be gotten through uh, at all. So an awful lot of what uh, needs to be done um, by the Biden administration is reversing policy after policy to end the migration uh, uh, protection protocols, migrant protection protocols. As Don said, the Biden administration has already announced the plans to do that. Now, the, the difficulty there is actually, what do you do? I don't think we'll see 40 or 50,000 migrants who are on the uh, asylum seekers on the Mexican side of the border simply admitted to the U.S. So the administration will have to come up with some orderly process for people to come into the country and to file these asylum claims, and that'll take some work. Secondly, uh, we need to withdraw from these agreements that send asylum seekers to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, which do not have asylum systems that can handle the claims being uh, sent to them. Um, thirdly, uh, this uh, with uh, the regulation that will establish new substantive standards uh, for asylum needs to be withdrawn. Most particularly, these, uh, these as I mentioned, these regs did lots, uh, lots of things, but a particular, um, a particular problem was they they made a gender of. Uh, claims based on um, uh, gender violence uh, virtually impossible to sustain as well as gang-based uh, violence. Um, in addition, uh, the attorney, the new attorney general is, will be able to take back cases, recertify to him or herself cases uh, that Attorney General Sessions and Attorney General Barr uh, had issued um, that tightened up on asylum standards uh, as well. That should be done. And on COVID, this does present a problem for the administration. As I mentioned, we currently have at the border a situation where people are simply pushed pushed back uh, under the guise of CDC guidance, which we now learn was really adopted by the administration over the objection of CDC professionals. <clears throat> but I think in the current, in the mix of the pandemic, you can't simply reverse that uh, decision. Um, and I think this needs to be part of a, a broader, part of the broad approach of the administration uh, on the pandemic. And if medical experts say we've got to leave this in place to some extent, maybe making some exceptions for people with particularly egregious cases, if they'll be sent back to harm, um, we'll have to listen, as the president-elect keeps saying, to the experts on how to handle uh, best uh, the virus. But what we need to certainly do is eliminate this pretext of COVID as a way to simply shut down 
uh, the southwest border and to shut down asylum uh, overall. Uh, one final comment. I think what, in the longer run, uh, what's needed here uh, will be a regional approach that brings in the countries uh, of the Northern Triangle, brings in Mexico, uh, other states to work on ways to handle migration flows and asylum flows throughout the region. Of course, the Trump administration has done nothing like that. It has simply bullied uh, the countries in the region. Thanks, Daniela. Thank you, Alex. Um, Wendy, we would like to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you, CMS, for including me in this panel and, and uh, including us also in the development of this very important paper. Um, I'm tempted to start by just saying ditto to everything Alex just said, um, but we'll add to it a bit. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the Trump administration has literally been a wrecking ball on the protection programs that are um, within our, our U.S. immigration and asylum laws and policies. And it's going to take time and a lot of concerted effort to rebuild from there. And unfortunately, but not surprisingly, these changes in policies have really um, dramatically impacted some of the most vulnerable populations that come to our border, including unaccompanied children, uh, which is the issue that I'll, I'll focus on, as well as families um, fleeing violence and persecution in their home countries, and particularly from Central America these days where the majority of asylum seekers are originating. Um, I'll start, you know, in terms of what's the status quo, just to flag the issues. And again, Alex um, noted some of these already. One is the sealing of the southern border and the fact that uh, under Title 42, the CDC policy that was initiated uh, um, at the end of March, um, this was the first time that we really saw the administration, after many attempts at attacking the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which codifies protections, particularly for unaccompanied children, that was the first time that we really saw them virtually gut implementation of that very critical law for children. So that policy um, remains in place. And um, sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> Uh, the, the joys of uh, telework. Um, but since that um, the CDC order was put in place, more than 13,000 unaccompanied children, children who arrived at our border would have been turned back. Um, second, we've externalized our border controls, and I think Alex uh, flagged this, so that we're, um, you know, we've seen that um, both Mexico and Central American countries, particularly Guatemala, have also been sealing their borders to migration. Um, next, the very obvious policy, um, the zero tolerance policy. Um, the courts ruled in, in uh, 2018 that family separation was unlawful, but even since then we've seen over uh, close to 2,000 families, I believe now, uh, continue to be separated. And as has been reported recently in the news, over 600 families that remain separated because of the zero tolerance policy. Um, next, the length of custody for unaccompanied children who are held by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. This is an issue that hasn't gotten much attention, but it's more than tripled under the current administration, despite the fact that both the TVPRA and the Flores Settlement Agreement say that children should be held for the shortest period of time possible in the least restrictive setting. Um, and Alex, I won't go into great detail here, Alex has already flagged the, the dramatic changes to asylum law, and particularly in the category of protection known as um, protecting members of a particular social group, which is where many children's claims um, fall, has been severely restricted in this, um, basically eliminating or almost eliminating children's access to, uh, to asylum. Um, so turning to what should they do next, um, there's obviously a lot in front of this new administration and there's going to be a lot of competing demands, not only within the immigration context, but I think many other issues in the social justice realm, as well as the pandemic itself, the economy that are going to need to be addressed. Um, but I would start with um, uh, first and foremost is lifting that border restriction. I think Alex did rightly flag that that's not going to be easy. There's a lot of people because of the migrant, um, so-called migrant protection protocols, um, and because of Title 42 that have been forced back into Mexico. Some have got, given up and gone home. Some have uh, sought asylum in Mexico as an alternative, but many, many people remain sitting on the other side of our border in uh, horrible conditions and tremendous squalor um, that threatens their, their health and their safety, and they're waiting to come in. 
So we're going to have to figure out quickly an orderly process um, to process those people that are waiting and to basically um, stand back up our asylum system writ large. Specifically to unaccompanied children, this is a bit easier in the sense that um, since the child migration crisis in 2014, the Office of Refugee Resettlement has increased its capacity to care for children tremendously. They, they maintain somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 to 15,000 beds currently. So they're, and currently they only, they have less than 2,000 kids in custody. So there's, there's space, bottom line. And, um, those facilities are set up in such a way that, um, children can be appropriately screened for COVID as they arrive. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I do think that we need to move quickly and we need to figure out what that process is. In addition to uh, ORR having space, it's also true that we have more capacity at the border and that there's a lot more deployment of N uh, international NGO, national NGOs, um, and UN agencies at the border. So there's more in place to help us with that processing. Um, uh, second, I think, and this is a day one issue to me, it's just, and, I, and uh, President-elect Biden has already spoken out on this, just stop family separations. I think um, Americans across the country of all sorts of backgrounds find this policy horrific and not in keeping with our national values. So I think a strong statement on day one through an executive order that this will not uh, occur again and um, calling for mechanisms to bring families back together who, who've been separated uh, since 2017 and the origins of the policy should be done. Um, next is to just restore due process to our adjudication of children's asylum claims. Um, in addition to the curtailments in asylum protections, we've also seen a, numerous procedural changes made in the immigration courts that make it much, much more difficult for children to present their cases. And it's hard for kids to begin with because as you can imagine, um, you know, uh, when you're a, a young person, understanding U.S. asylum law, U.S. immigration law, having to present your case in a formal courtroom setting, um, raising a defense, for example, to demonstrate that you have a well-founded fear founded fear of persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, trying, try being a young person and navigating that system. Um, so we need to restore the, the procedures that allowed kids the time uh, to find a lawyer and to develop their cases. And just as a footnote there, um, because of family separation, Kind's um, youngest client is now four months old, um, which tells you the ludicrousy of children being in court by themselves, which brings me to my next point. It is time to ensure that every child who's in immigration court has a lawyer standing by their side. It's um, the, the statistics are overwhelming. Children with counsel are five times more likely to be granted some form of, of status. And just the simple humanity of asking a young person to be in that court in such difficult circumstances, not speaking the language, not understanding our laws, um, already traumatized by what happened to them in their home country and the journey here is, is, is just something we need to do as a country. Um, so I will... Stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, Charles, could we turn turn over to you? Can you tell us about legal immigration and the challenges where we are and how? Uh, what are your recommendations? Sure. Thanks, Daniela, and thanks, Don, and CMS for holding this. Um, legal immigration. I guess I'd describe the status quo now as pretty much an unholy mess. Numbers have dropped precipitously uh, from 2016 to 2019. Annual lawful immigration to the United States fell by almost half. Uh, we were averaging a little over a million immigrants a year now. Uh, during that three-year period, it fell to about 600,000 a year. Uh, this year, 2020, probably likely to see the fewest immigrants since the Great Depression. Uh, obviously, some of that's due to the coronavirus, but a lot of it's also due to Trump policies. Um, as you know, TPS, uh, temporary protected status, is, is sort of hanging by its fingernails, uh, really only because of court decisions, much like DACA. Uh, but TPS, for about four or five countries now, affects 400,000 people living in the United States, Salvadorans, Hondurans, Nicaraguans, Nepalese, uh, Haitians, uh, South Sudanese. So a lot of reform needs to happen in that to bolster that. 
include TPS for Venezuelans, for example. Uh, that's uh, fairly easy to do. Uh, I wanted to talk really about some of the policies that have affected and discouraged people from even filing for legal immigration. And the top of the list is really public charge. Um, I think it's no exaggeration to really call that a wealth test. The prior policy back in 1999, when the Clinton administration defined public charge, it was someone who was primarily dependent on federal cash benefit programs. Uh, with the new public charge rule that went into effect in February of this year, uh, the factors they look at are age, health, income, education, work history, job skills, uh, English proficiency, credit scores, numerous amounts of documentation required. Many, many people are reluctant to file for adjustment of status now based on these new requirements. Many are reluctant to go abroad and file for an immigrant visa. So you've got this uh, current backlog, I guess you would say, of people that just even discouraged from going forward. What could happen there? Relatively easy, um, although it's not uh, overnight. It's not like an executive order that you can simply issue. You would have to go through the regulatory process, but uh, we're thinking about an interim final rule that could be issued fairly quickly that reverses the language that was in the 1999 rule and replaces that with a lot of the language that was already in the 1990, uh, the, well, the older rule, uh, the Clinton rule, I think could be substituted for that language. Also, you've got a lot of uh, case law. You've got uh, courts that have enjoined the rule. So I think the uh, Biden administration could also settle those lawsuits. Uh, one of those cases is on, on its way to the Supreme Court, and I'm not sure uh, we're very optimistic about that result. Uh, so you could do both uh, regulatory and, and lit litigative efforts to reverse that policy. That would be quick. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is the fact that the USCIS has really become an enforcement agency now, and that wasn't the way it was set up. There was supposed to be this wall, really, between ICE that was the enforcement branch of DHS and USCIS where people should feel free to file for benefits. Now, it's more like a tag team effort where if you file for an immigration benefit and you're denied and you're not in lawful immigration status, which a lot of people aren't, uh, then you are issued a notice to appear and you're put into deportation proceedings. So that has obviously discouraged a lot of people from filing. Uh, USCIS is doing that fairly regularly now. Uh, whereas the prior policy was only unless you were a uh, convicted felon or a criminal issue or you are a security threat, would they issue a notice to appear? So that really sort of dovetails into the prosecutorial discretion uh, that the Biden administration could restore that would existed under the Obama administration. Uh, the third issue I wanted to talk about really goes to the issue of backlogs. And part of this deals with the fact that the USCIS is running out of money. Uh, in fact, it's in this sort of death spiral where it uh, cuts off revenue from TPS, DACA, uh, family-based immigration, refugee, whatever, uh, then reduces staff because it doesn't have the revenue, uh, which creates more backlogs, which then discourages people further. Uh, we have now backlogs that are as lo longer than anything I've experienced in the 40 years I've been doing immigration law. Uh, where if you're trying to get work authorization, you're trying to immigrate a, a fiance, you're trying to renew your work card, your green card, whatever, it's taking years. Uh, and that's ridiculous. The consulate in Juarez, even before the pandemic happened, uh, was facing about a year long backlog. And somebody, this is, if you've done all the documentation, you're ready to go, you're still waiting for a year for an interview. Uh, and that's based on prioritization. That's just simply staffing. That's just simply moving people around. Uh, and a lot of the backlogs that the USCIS is facing is really due to this extreme vetting that they've done. They've taken people off of adjudications and put them into this uh, long room where they're digging up old files, looking for fraud where none existed. Uh, they're still looking for those 3 million undocumented immigrants that voted for Hillary, right? Uh, so they ought to move forward. They ought to get off of that. Uh, and they ought to go back to doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, so end mandatory interviews, restore reasonable filing fees, uh, and get back to where they were. So that's a start. Thank you, Charles. Excellent. Uh, we'll move it. Uh, we'll move along to Don. Uh, you can tell us about border enforcement. 
and immigration detention. Go ahead. Yeah, these are two big issues, so I'm just going to scratch the surface on them and outline a few of our proposals. But as most of you know, the U.S. immigrant detention system doesn't hold anyone serving a prison sentence. It holds people during the removal adjudication process, which is a civil, not a criminal process. Yet it detains people in prison-like facilities, most of them run by private corporations. The Trump administration obviously has sought to expand this system and further privatize it. The administration has also used the harshness of the system, its inhumanity, to deter others from seeking to migrate to the, to the U.S. and to divide families, of course. In 1996, the U.S. detained around 8,500 persons a night. And the Obama, by the Obama administration, this number had risen to about 34,000 a night. In the Trump era, it rose to 56,000, and it was on a pace to go to 60,000. After COVID-19 struck, dozens of detention centers became COVID hotspots. 7,200 detainees have been confirmed infected, although that number is obviously very, very low and an undercount. And the detention system overall became a vector for the spread of the virus. The detention population also began to fall, and it's at about 17,500 today. Prior to the pandemic, detention was the government's default option for persons in removal proceedings. Yet in the overwhelming majority of cases, DHS can achieve the goals that detention serves, which are to ensure appearances in proceedings, and in rare cases to protect the public through alternative programs. Our report pro proposes that DHS under the Biden administration issue policy guidance to the effect that detention should be the exception, not the rule for those in the removal adjudication system, and that detention should be used only when strictly necessary to meet the twin goals of ensuring appearances and public safety. So what to do about cases in which detention is statutorily mandated? Well, what's not mandated is prison-like facilities. That's not statutorily mandated. So we propose that alternative programs with different degrees of supervision and support ought to be viewed as alternative forms of detention and, made, and those programs ought to be made available to mandatory detainees. Moreover, these programs have consistently ensured high court appearance rates. We also propose that the number of detainees should be limited by establishing prosecutorial discretion guidelines that apply to all U.S. immigration enforcement programs. These guidelines should presumptively provide for the parole, that is the release of members of vulnerable populations. We also propose that ICE should review all detainees for possible release at least every six months and should document why detainees have not been released. We call for ending the use of private corporations to administer immigrant detention centers. These, um, these corporations have a deplorable record regarding the treatment and safety of detainees that goes back decades uh, and, uh, and the safety of facility staff as well, including maybe particularly during the COVID-19 crisis. Our paper also proposes ways to strengthen detention oversight. Since its creation in 2002, DHS's Office of Inspector General has issued 39 critical reports on detention conditions, and some of these deficiencies have remained unaddressed for years. We recommend that the Biden administration encourage OIG to more deeply investigate detention conditions, oversight systems, and compliance with detention standards and contract terms, and the DHS act on OIG's recommendations. On the border, um, this is a very big issue, but let me try to quickly summarize six of the report's proposals on border enforcement. First, foremost, we propose that the Biden administration defund construction of the border wall, which Trump has failed to convince co even Congress to pay for, much less Mexico to pay for. Expansion of the wall is unnecessary, given massive enforcement funding and infrastructure, and it does nothing to stop people who overstay their visas, who outnumber border crossers now two to one and have for years now. Second, reports from many sources over many years have revealed consistently high levels of physical and verbal abuse of migrants by border patrol agents including threats and racist ethnic sexist and homophobic epithets studies have also demonstrated persistent inaction on these complaints we urge the biden administration to adopt a zero tolerance approach to verbal and physical abuse 
and for DHS to make an agency-wide commitment to identify and expeditiously address patterns of abuse. Third, we propose that the administration issue an order limiting expedited removal to persons apprehended shortly after their arrival at a port of entry or near a land border and who lack proper documents. In July of 2019, the administration announced that the expedited removal program would be extended to persons arrested anywhere in the country who lacked proper documentation and could not prove they had been in the US for at least two years. We urge that this notice be withdrawn and that all directives to expand the program over the years be withdrawn. Fourth, we propose that the Biden administration systematically review CBP's various stop, search and seizure legal authorities, policies and programs, CBP's enforcement footprint and practices have generated concerns regarding warrantless searches and seizures and the infringement of constitutional rights across the vast stretches, vast and growing stretches of the country. The Biden administration should review these statutory authorities and evaluate DHS enforcement policies and practices with the goal of establishing effective rights respecting policies. Fifth, we make a number of proposals related to the need to change CBP's culture, which has led to high rates of abuse of migrants, as well as the systematic refusal of agents to refer asylum seekers to the asylum process as they're legally required to do. These proposals involve hiring practices, background checks, training of frontline agents and their supervisors, and developing appropriate performance standards that are tied to reviews and promotions. And six, we recommend that the Biden administration commit paying more attention to conditions prompting people to migrate from Northern Triangle states and elsewhere. And in fact, the, the Biden administration has already announced that this is going to be one of its priorities. The fact is that an enforcement only policy focused on the US-Mexico border will never work and doesn't suffice. Thank you, Don, and thank you everyone for providing that lay of the land. Um, one policy that I'd like to bring up is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, or the DACA program. Um, as you may know, the, this program was created in 2012 by the Obama administration, and it allowed more than 800,000 immigrants who arrived in the country as children the opportunity to obtain a two-year renewable work permit and a retrieve, reprieve from deportation. Um, as a beneficiary of the program myself, I can speak to the numerous benefits that DACA provides, ranging from access to more and better job opportunities to access to higher education, an increased sense of belonging, and just improved mental health. Um, the Trump administration attempted to rescind the program in 2017, and thanks to the work of litigators, this rescission was partly halted. Um, since 2017, only those of us who had apl already applied for the program we're allowed to continue renewing our work permits. But that also meant that thousands of immigrants who became eligible after 2017 have not been able to apply for DACA due to the cancellation uh, by the Trump administration. So after the Supreme Court held that the Trump administration had unlawfully terminated the program in June, uh, DHS issued a memo that reduces the employment authorization period under DACA from two years to one year that's cre creating a financial and administrative burden on immigrant families, um, who I should emphasize um, have served in the thousands as essential workers during this pandemic. Um, DHS has also refused to start accepting new applicants into the program. So what can the Biden-Harris administration do to help the thousands of DACA recipients who have grown up in the country and consider this our home? Um, the administration has already expressed its commitment to reinstate DACA, but beyond that, the administration should also consider removing the upper bound age limit of less than 30 um, of eight from, I'm sorry, removing the upper bound age limit of less than 31 to apply for DACA. Also raising the age limit at the time of entry from age 16 to age 18 to qualify. Um, updating the continuous resident criterion that requires five years of continuous residence to the date of the restarting of the program. Um, the Biden-Harris administration could also broaden the reasons to provide advance parole to also include family-related reasons. And most importantly, work with Congress to finally secure 
a path to citizenship for DACA recipients and undocumented immigrants who arrived in the country as minors and have long-standing ties to the country. Um, other potential administrative actions include eliminating technical obstacles that keep us from adjusting our status through family-based or employment-based sponsorships. For instance, uh, the Biden-Harris administration could create a parole in place program and also establish a rule that clarifies that eligible undocumented immigrants were not at fault for failing to maintain lawful status. Um, so some of, these are some of the additional recommendation for, for the incoming administration. So we're getting numerous questions from the audience. And before we turn to them, um, I would like to ask our panelists to tell us about the challenges that the Biden-Harris administration will face in implementing all these recommendations. Would anyone like to start? Well, I can say something which sure. which has been part of response to one of the questions. Um, you know, for the regulations that have been put in place, uh, they can't simply be withdrawn under the Supreme Court. Actually, the Supreme Court decision in the DACA case, um, reasons have to be given for withdrawing regulations. So there'll be a lengthy process if the public charge uh, regulation, for, for example, is to be withdrawn. There'll have to be a new notice uh, published in the Federal Register and comments given and reasons given before that can be withdrawn. The proposed regulations uh, can be more easily taken back, but uh, the stuff that's been put in place is going to going to take some time. So that's one I think one obstacle we have to we have to recognize. I would just state something that I think is you know front and center for so many of us these days, which is just we are still living in a very divided, very polarized country, and people have uh, uh, very disparate views on the immigration issue. And we're going to you know looks like we're going to have a Congress that's going to be um, very tight, and it's it's split between the two. Party. So I think that could create challenges for the administration to push things forward. I think on that point, I think one of the biggest challenges is Biden himself, uh, who has run on this idea of bringing the country together, uh, reaching across the aisle, uh, bringing a divided country together, making incremental changes, seeking compromising, finding middle ground. I think that's uh, Obama tried that. It didn't work out all that well. Uh, so. I hope he doesn't waste a lot of time trying to please Mitch McConnell uh, and just sort of goes at it, frankly. And I think we do have a little window here because uh, a lot of the attention is going to be on the pandemic, on the economy, health care, et cetera. So a lot of this stuff can happen somewhat under the radar. Um, I think, Daniela, that the, um, I mean, one overarching challenge is precisely the fact that the um, the Biden administration is facing so many other huge issues. And it always does seem like immigration gets pushed to the side at the beginning of a, an administration. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that, but um, I guess enthused by their commitment to doing a lot of things quickly that they're talking about doing. I mean, I think on, on immigration, the major challenge I think is just People don't, still don't realize the extent of the damage worked on the system by the Trump administration, how many things there are to do. We chose 40, you know, 40 points. We probably could have picked 400 if, we, if we'd wanted to, because there's, there's literally that much that needs to be done. And in some, I think in some cases, this requires, like with resettlement, build, rebuilding systems and infrastructure from scratch, really. Um, I like to agree too with Wendy that like, I think that the, the kind of the vilification of immigrants, the mischaracterization of Trump's administrative action in this area, which wasn't primarily about enforcement or public safety at all. That's another challenge that we're facing with, you know, a large, a large percentage of the country that's going to be opposed to all of this. And like, yeah, and I think that there's other challenges related to particular particular measures, which I maybe could talk about later. Great. Thank you. And I think in connection to that question, um, or to those points rather, um, I'd like to raise this question from an audience member. Um, 
what do you think are the best means for advocates and academics to support proposals for executive action during the transition? Um, what are some of the key spaces where efforts are being coordinated? Would anyone like to address that question? I can just say, you know, I think the focus right now is um, on the transition process and getting ideas. And this is very much what the, the paper that we all worked on is intended to do. Um, you know, get it to the right people for consideration early on because there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of issues that are going to need a lot of attention. And I think, you know, my experience from working on the Hill is, um, you know, the more detailed and operationally focused the recommendations are, it's e the easier it is for an administration to actually pick it up and run with it. Um, so to the extent that we can feed into those conversations, I think it'll be really important. I just want to underscore what Wendy said is that really detailed suggestions are helpful. But what I've heard is that the transition team is actually only working on policies that the Biden campaign had made uh, during the campaign. So I think the idea of the, that getting recommendations to the transition team now will produce a blueprint that will be taken forward is not is not what this transition team is doing, and it's not really how transition teams work. It's often true that uh, there's a transition report written, but when you when the political appointees are put in office, they come up with their own priorities. So in some ways, I think the most important work will come after January 20th. The preparatory work has to be done now in terms of putting together sensible proposals, but we're really going to have to see who's appointed to these major political positions in the administration and thinking about how to get their attention and get the proposals before them. I think that's more can be more important than trying to see if we can influence the transition work at the moment. Just to add to that one other point, I think it's going to be critical for this administration to appoint somebody senior within the White House who coordinates actions on immigration, because one of the things that we saw uh, I would say, especially during the Obama years, is there's a lot of federal agencies that are involved in immigration policy and implementation, and that um, inherently creates bureaucratic delays, and um, frankly, we don't have time to waste. So appointing somebody who can bring the agencies together and really um, force decisions and force action, I think it's going to be critical. It's true. The need, for, the, the need here is for a really fast start, I think. I mean, that was... I think that those that looked at kind of the Obama administration think that, and including people within the Obama administration, think that it was too delayed. They needed to get started immediately. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, I, I'll, I would like to raise it to Charles, um, and it's about public charge. Um, so the question is, is just reversing the public charge rule enough? Um, how could the new administration build confidence among non-citizens that it is safe to apply for public benefits and that it won't come back to bite them when they apply for a green card or naturalization? Um, that's a very good question. Right now, I don't think we've actually had any decisions on either adjustment applicants or immigrant visas that have denied based on the new public charge rule. So that's a plus. Uh, all of this, what we're talking about is really discouraging people from filing. Uh, and obviously to even apply for adjustment right now, you have to include this new form, you have to include all this documentation. Um, I agree with Alex that it is gonna have to be sort of a slow measured approach in terms of the regulatory process. You can't just issue something overnight, uh, but possibly an inter interim final rule issued fairly quickly that does justify the change, possibly withdrawing the uh, lawsuits, uh, and restoring the injunctions uh, might be a way to do that. Uh, it may drag out for a while, it may take the better part of a year. But uh, to get to the point, the 1999 policy notice uh, in the Federal Register was never codified in regulations. Uh, I don't know why that never happened, but I think if we could do that, take a lot of that language, substitute it in for the 2019 language, uh, give it, uh, let comments be drawn and finalize that, that would be a big step forward in saying, this is the rule now, this is what you have to follow. Uh, these are the, uh, this is the form that you're gonna be using. Uh, part of the problem with public charge is that the five factors, age, health, et cetera, are in the statute uh, and they were sleeping there for a while. All of the attention was on what we call the sponsor, the person who started the process. Uh, so if we can put the emphasis back on the petitioner 
on the sponsor away from the intending immigrant or the adjustment applicant, I think that'd be a big step forward in sort of making that concrete and making that formal. That would be how I would approach it. Very good, thank you. Uh, this next question um, is for Wendy. Consistent with proposals to ensure increased time, um, increased fairness for children and adults who have appeared before immigration courts, what support, if any, is there for a movement to remove immigration judges from the Justice Department and to create an Article One court? That's an idea that I think is really gaining traction, and I think particularly during the Trump years uh, uh, gained urgency as well. Um, you know, currently the judges serve at the pleasure of the Attorney General, and I think that politicizes their decisions. Um, very frequently and even more frequently during the Trump years. So it's um, certainly something that I think is going to gain focus and should gain focus, um, but it will require legislation. So it, it brings you to all the challenges of, of working with Congress. Thank you. Um, then this next question uh, relates to what we were, uh, you all were discussing a little bit earlier. Um, Implementing these recommendations will require new leadership, as you mentioned, in the agencies responsible for migration and refugee policy. What should be the criteria for appointments to these agencies? Alex, any thoughts on that? Well, I'll say this in a funny way, maybe. The, one of the things the Trump administration did was to remove from the US CIS mission statement reference to the United States as a nation of immigrants. I would think I would start by appointing people who believe this is a country that's a nation of immigrants. Uh, one who believes that USCIS and in fact the government as a whole is there to welcome immigrants, to integrate them into the country, uh, to help them on a path to permanent residence and perhaps citizenship here. But obviously beyond that, we need talented people with experience uh, who agree with the overall thrust of the administration. Uh, well, I mean, you know, Trump put in office people who agreed with him and they've done terrible things. That's what we've been talking about. And Biden needs to put into office people who are going to change those things. Anyone else has any thoughts about that? I think you have to, I, I agree totally with Alex, and actually, actually Alex uh, can speak from history and experience in doing this, but you have to choose people who know something about the law, um, who, and I think that's where Trump was really fairly effective, uh, bringing in um, Stephen Miller and his whole sort of coterie of people who really looked deeply and came in there with an agenda and with knowledge of where these rigs are, what policies need to change, uh, and surprisingly effective in, in unearthing a lot of uh, issues that uh, I think they waited too long, frankly. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't act a lot sooner on a lot of this stuff, and I'm glad they didn't. For example, expedited removal was something they could have done fairly quickly. Uh, now it's, uh, it's uh, final moments here. Uh, but I think really experience speaks a lot. The only thing I would add, I think, I totally agree with what Alex and Charles both said is, um, I think it's helpful to have people with managerial experience because the bureaucracies that are implementing these laws are enormous at this point. Um, so somebody who knows how to lead, manage budgets, uh, delegate is gonna be important too. I'm curious, Wendy, if you think that the, um, you were talking about the coordination function at the White House, which is the way that it should be, but it, doesn't seem that it's actually operated like that over the last four years, yet the White House pretty much got what it's want, it wanted because it has somebody in place that almost oversaw those agencies and went, and went beyond kind of the titular heads of them. And is that the, is that the kind of person you're talking about in the White House position or, are you, or is it just kind of a, an honest broker that's bringing people together to move along an agenda? Well, it's definitely not exactly that person <laughs> in the next administration. Um, no, I think it has to be somebody who's really at a senior level who has the, the authority designated to them to bring the agencies together and, and force the decision-making process and the implementation process. 
um, because you, 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 during the Obama years, we saw a lot of kind of just jockeying for turf between the agencies, volleying issues back and forth, and it, it resulted in tremendous delays and in some cases failure to act completely. All right. Um, so the next question um, is on nativism. Um, and it says, the election of Donald Trump and the policies implemented by his administration can be viewed by, as a nativist reaction before the multidimensional crisis experienced in the United States. Uh, bearing this in mind, what can the Biden administration do to tackle the root causes of nativism, both the material and Men mental ones, um, that is the political culture in, the, in relation to immigrants. Would anyone like to address that? Well, I'll say two things on that. And one, one from the report and one that goes beyond the report and the second one may well annoy people uh, on the panel, but I'll say it anyway. Um, the first in the report is the, um, is the president should make um, a speech early on in the administration about the basic values of the administration vis-a-vis -vis immigration and refugees. Um, we've got to change the discourse in the country. It's been polluted. It's, uh, and, and, and a president has that bully pulpit. We, we, we see that from the way Trump was able to change the discourse. So a, a strong presidential statement, maybe one on refugees, one on immigration, but lays out the facts and lays out what the direction will be, I think could go a long way on, on as I said, changing the discourse. The second thought on nativism, I'm not an expert on this, but I must have been thinking more and more that um, rather than going at it directly, it may be best to go at it indirectly, meaning the causes of nativism. If, if nativism is a function of economic uh, insecurity or status concerns uh, in the country, then uh, one way I think we could actually advance the immigration agenda is to be proposing broad-based economic policies uh, that benefit all Americans, that remove economic insecurity, that are not specifically directed at immigrants uh, or particular groups, but rather uh, try to, uh, as I say, uh, generally appeal to economic insecurity in the country. And we've seen proposals for that in the Democratic platform and, and the like, but I, that that may be a, a more effective way of, uh, of reducing nativism than calling nativists out for being nativists, which does not seem to be a very effective strategy. Well, let me give a, a counter proposal, which would be uh, not having a major speech on immigration, refugees, et cetera, uh, with the idea that people are going to listen to Trump, uh, listen to Biden and change their mind. I think the less he says, actually, the better. I would not bring this up as a national issue that we need to address. I think it's more discourse from the right. Um, I think that people form their opinions really based on their neighbors, the, their personal uh, uh, experiences with other immigrants, uh, and they're not really led by any kind of speech. Bush, to his credit, George W., gave several speeches on how we need to uh, improve and increase legal immigration. It went nowhere. It didn't imp uh, didn't uh, convince any Republicans to join him on his uh, campaign or on his uh, legislative efforts. So, I think less is more. I think you ought to be quiet on this issue. You can do things though, like um, I mean, it's not it's not very hard to improve and kind of do quiet things in the way that Trump did very public things. I mean, his basic tactic was that if any immigrant committed any kind of offense that would be ascribed to all immigrants, particularly undocumented people or whatever it might be. And it was one of, you know, just pretty much constant vilification and denigration of immigrants, basically treating them as subhuman. And I think that Biden, you know, he, he he's obviously going to have a totally different approach. And I think that, you know, lifting up the aspirations of immigrants, lifting up their their humanity, lifting up their contributions to the country. I do think that that's like, that's important. There's a, there's a public education and there's a tone and there's a language that he can, that he can lead on that I think is extremely important. But having said that, I actually don't think that the government's the major player in this. I think it's really civil society that really has to, has to take over this issue and the federal government, things are just too politicized and I, there is an element, I think, um, 
that Charles mentioned, if Biden, if Bi or maybe hinted at, if Biden is talking about something, 70 million people in the country are going to be rejecting it, you know? Whereas if it's coming from religious leaders, civic leaders, business people, law enforcement people, the reception might be different. But it's really about, you know, showing immigrants as they are, not, not the kind of negative fantasy that the Trump administration pushed for years and years. I totally agree. And I think, you know, setting an example, first and foremost, um, and views, using his voice constructively will go a long way, given what we've just gone through in four years of dog whistles and war shouts. Um, I'd also say just, you know, reaching out, engaging with immigrant communities directly, I think would be very helpful to this administration, hear what they have to say. Um, and bringing diversity into, into his cabinet and, and the positions that are overseeing the immigration system would be helpful. Very good. Thanks, everyone. And um, looking now beyond the U.S. Uh, border, um, how will the Biden administration address the root causes of migration in Latin America? And should it try to address those uh, root causes? There's one thing I've learned is I'm a migration expert. I'm not a development or <laughs> policy expert. Um, but I do think that looking um, looking specifically at Central America, um, we really have to focus our foreign assistance and, and our diplomacy at a very high level at restoring the rule of law and um, addressing the corruption that you see in those governments is first and foremost. And then I think we also need to look at a community development level so that we're really creating opportunities for families, for children, and for others to remain home and be able to thrive and succeed and feel safe in their own societies. I just would say that I don't think you can overestimate the impact of drug-related gangs uh, in Central America, particularly Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras right now. They are a major political party. Anybody running for office has to make deals with the gangs. Uh, so they're rooted in the system now. It's not a matter of throwing uh, anti-drug money at the uh, issue. It's, it's really top to bottom, ingrained in the whole system. And I don't know whether it's reversible at this point. Uh, so I'm not trying to be discouraging, but I don't think simply putting more money into the same programs we're doing is going to necessarily lead to uh, some sort of major humanitarian impact. So I don't know the answer, but it isn't. It's, it's a serious issue. There I mean, I think that there needs to be a greater investment in it, though, understanding the conditions that are driving people in from discrete communities in those countries, even, you know, I mean, and there are programs that are that are successful, maybe they're on a smaller scale than they need to be. But it's worth it's worth the investment, given like the extraordinary amounts of money that we pay just for border enforcement that doesn't really work and can't work without addressing kind of the the conditions that are driving people. So I think that I, I believe, you know, given his, given the, given the president-elect's experience in the, with those countries and with a lot of the leaders there, that he'll be very focused on this. And I think that's appropriate. Development is not exactly the right thing, though. I think it is more the rule of law. I mean, development. If what you're doing is pumping development monies in with the idea that it's going to stop people from coming. That's the wrong reason to do it. You know, the reason to develop an area is to is for the well being of that area and the people there and some of them may then have the resources to migrate that didn't before. So the kind of connection between development and migration is tricky. And uh, thank you to our audience. The questions keep coming in and they vary widely on, on the topics. So uh, let's switch gears a little bit and um, talk about what is the role of philanthropic funders um, in advancing this agenda? How can they play uh, a role in making sure that we promote and continue the, the agenda that we just uh, laid out? Well, first and foremost, I say that um, funders need to understand that we have a moment now, we have an opportunity now, and um, not to kind of 
uh, build into their planning an expectation that the Biden administration will be able to take these issues on, tackle them, cure them, and therefore um, those that are working in and around the administration don't need the support. So um, uh, I would say, you know, keep the resources coming in because this might be the moment in which we can fix a lot of the, the immigration and refugee challenges that we've been facing over the past few years. Um, second, I would say, is also to support um, organizations in thinking creatively about how to solve these problems. And, um, you know, this isn't just a, a moment to rinse and repeat from the Obama administration. We need to learn lessons from both those years as well as the Trump years and figure out some really pragmatic solutions and a path forward. I mean, I always thought that one of the most positive functions of foundations, you know, besides providing support that facilitates work is actually bringing together people that ought to be talking to each other that aren't necessarily talking to each other. And that's a that's still a big need in this in this field. You know, everybody's extraordinarily busy, and um, it's not it's not a question of trying to get everybody to walk in lockstep. I think that that's that's not the solution, and it shouldn't be the goal. But to put people in dialogue that need to be in dialogue to solve these problems is a is a key role for foundations. And I would add to that: this may be idealistic and, and not doable, but it, it's actually bringing communities together in terms of learning from um, people who are expert in other issue areas, climate being one that I think we need to start paying attention to, or are paying attention to in the migration field, but really need to do a deep dive on the development community, as we just talked about, the foreign policy community. So I think there's um, there's a lot we can be learning from each other. Uh, you know, and we should we shouldn't pass this opportunity to say thanks to the foundations that have been funding the organizing all these years that made such a difference and put us in such a different place right now than we were in you know six months ago. So that was a that was a great investment. <laughs> thanks to all of those that were involved in that. Absolutely. So um, the next question relates to public resources and. Um, Along with the vilification of immigrants by the Trump administration, we have to be concerned about the loss of ground of the African American community. Uh, immigrants and African Americans share many problems, including incarceration. How can the immigrant rights organizations do their work and at the same time take into account the needs of African Americans and the tension, either real or imagined, uh, about the use of public resources? Well, I'll say, I think there's some really interesting work now being done between um, uh, the movements uh, for black for black lives and also for racial justice and immigrants' rights movements. There's a, a an overlap, a, a convergence of thoughts around abolition uh, uh, of uh, prisons and defunding or abolishing uh, ICE, there's there's a recognition that these are, are really related issues. And at the ground level, there's some good organizing going on, uh, bringing these groups together. And I think that's actually very fruitful. There have been times in, in uh, U.S. history where sometimes the interests of African-Americans and immigrants have been seen as conflicting. But I think in this particular uh, moment, um, there's actually a lot of common cause that could be done. That's got to be done on the ground by, by the organizers. It's starting. Great. Um, this next question relates to um, a longer term reform. So the report that was released earlier today um, does not recommend breaking up DHS, which um, would certainly require legislation and therefore might not be doable under the democratic control uh, without the democratic control of the Senate. Um, is breaking up DHS or separating the immigration agencies a long term goal worth pursuing? I, I think what the report, one, one thing that the report does do, because it's focused on, it's not focused on legislation. And I think just generally to tell people, you could criticize us for particular proposals in the report, but don't criticize us for what's not there because there could be another, you know, 400, 400 issues that we covered. And we tried to, we tried to be limited in what we covered. Um, 
but but I think what the report does do is it does recognize that there's anomalies within the Department of Homeland Security that wouldn't have been anticipated at the time that agency was created and that those need to be fixed. The idea of Border Patrol agents now now becoming asylum officers, which was a pilot program of the Trump administration, is is ridiculous, you know. And Charles also talked about the degree to which USCIS has has is veering into kind of an enforcement agency, which is also inappropriate for a service agency and wasn't anticipated at the creation of the, of the Department of Homeland Security. So if there's, if it's not performing and doing what it should have done at the, it, as it was envisioned to do at the time of its creation, then that's a big, that's a bigger issue, but we didn't tackle that whole issue because it's a, um, because that's a legislative issue and it was really beyond the scope of what we were trying to do. But I, yeah, I do think it's a, it would be a good time and timely to look at, to evaluate DHS um, and, and to see, you know, where it's been successful and, and where the problems are. I feel like there's very significant problems in the culture of the enforcement agencies at this point. Thank you. Um, this next question is, um, and it has already received, a few people have uh, asked about it. Um, what advice would you give researchers who want to help move, fo move forward this agenda? What sort of research questions um, are on the top of your mind? Um, I don't know, Wendy, if you wanna get us started there. Um. Thinking off the top of my head on this one, um, one I think is to do a, a update our, our information, the quality of our information about the difference that council makes in immigration proceedings. Um, you know, I think it's um, it it's proving itself to be a win-win for the the system as well as for the applicant or the immigrant. So that would be one. Um, two, I would love to see more research on what's happening south of our border. Um, hopefully we will see MPP and, and Title 42 lifted pretty quickly, but um, we know that the, the conditions there are atrocious um, for people who are waiting, and I think um, that needs more, uh, needs to be brought into the public light more. Well, on public charge, I'd love to see a lot of the myths debunked. Uh, I think these come up periodically and get debunked, but then they keep rising again. Uh, and certainly eligibility for and access and receipt of public benefits is one of the ones that uh, I would love to see more research into to try to uh, correct any misinformation about the fact that immigrants come here to get benefits. Uh, the other issue that uh, I think could also use more research is the issue of criminal conduct. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that uh, from Trump's impressions that people come here for various nefarious reasons. And I think the studies at least have shown that the uh, criminal, the rate of uh, arrest convictions uh, for non-citizens is actually much lower than that for U.S. Uh, domestic citizens. So I'd love to see more research into that as well. I think the one that you mentioned before, Charles, too, on public charge, the um, more on kind of the way that that's no matter how, you know, no matter what the Biden administration does, and even before it went into into effect, it was operating as a disincentive to, for people to use certain public benefits, you know, and there there could be more research on that focused on how to turn that around. What do you need to do to let people know that they're actually safe and can use public benefits for which they're eligible and qualify? I'd add uh, two, these are more policy uh, oriented. Um, one is really, we have to open up the Southwest border. We've got to put that back in place as a border that, that as Taurus Meissen used to say, a border that works. Uh, and that and that means making it making it possible for people to request asylum for moving uh, people over the border who should be able to get in uh, smoothly. But we've got a large population of people on the Mexican side of the border that we've kept there. We now have this COVID expulsion policy, and exactly how to open that up again in a reasonable, measured way is is not easy. And I think it's it's not something we address in the report. We flag it. 
but I think the next kind of policy paper really, and it would be helpful to the administration to really think hard about, okay, we know we wanna get beyond that stuff, but how do we do it? The second is, is thinking hard about ICE. Um, you know, I think when people talked about abolishing ICE originally, those of us in the policy community said, oh, don't say that, it's gonna be like to fund the police and that means open borders and whatever. But I think people have to take a really serious look at ICE, about the money that is spent on detention, about the money that is spent on operations inside the country and begin to think about whether that money, just like in the defund the police movement, that money can be spent elsewhere on welcoming immigrants, on reducing the backlog, in the US CIS uh, and the like. You know, one thing we've discovered with COVID is detention has gone down by what, down more than 50% over the last uh, two or three, uh, six months or so. Uh, and it's not as if letting people out of detention has meant the immigration system has fallen apart. Well, why can't we live with a much lower level uh, of detention with ICE detaining far fewer uh, people? So, I, I mean, I, I think there is a moment now to really think hard about what what ice is all about and, and how can we how can we begin to rethink how can we begin to think about reallocating the billions of dollars we put into that enforcement effort i mean the research might be on community safety in that context you know are they are they making communities safer are they making the country safer or not there'd be a lot of ways to get at that i would think Certainly, a lot of localities think that they're not. Right, right. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing. And um, we are at the top of the hour. So, um, to conclude, uh, I would like to invite Alex, who is a lead author of the paper released today by the Zolberg Institute and the Center for Migration Studies, to provide a closing statement. Well, I'll just be very brief. I think we've talked about a lot. I first to say that. The Zolberg Institute was really delighted to work with CMS on producing uh, this paper, and we were aided, as Don said at the outset, by an amazing group of experts. Two of them are here, uh, Wendy and Charles, that really uh, helped us think through some very difficult um, issues. Um, you know, as we look at the immigration policy landscape, it's like a hurricane or a tornado has, has passed through. There's just wreckage everywhere and processes and policies that took years to put in place are now just in ruins. Uh, and the presentations today, I think, give some sense of that uh, damage. And the question is really how to rebuild it. And where do, you, where do you start? Now, as Don mentioned at the outset, uh, the Biden administration uh, has already indicated some of the policies it will move very quickly on the Muslim ban and on DACA, the, the proposed moratorium on removals on public charge. Um, but there are lots of other policies that are less in the news, uh, but have a large impact. And that's what we tried to do in the report was to look at policies that could be changed in the first year and would have a significant impact. As, uh, as Don said, we made 40 uh, recommendations in that regard. And what makes these administrative recommendations even more important today is the fact that it's likely, it's not a done deal, but it's likely that the Senate, or let me put it this way, if the Senate stays in Republican hands, um, then the administration is going to hack, have to think about how to act in an administrative um, fashion. You know, we hope that the report uh, provides a roadmap for rebuilding, for reform. Uh, and we're, we're pretty confident that if the recommendations we propose are adopted, that, that they will improve the lives of, of millions of non-citizens uh, and their families in this country. Well said. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panelists today and to our attendees for joining us. Um, a special thank you too, and a shout out to all the organizers and the allies uh, who made this voter turnout and this electoral victory possible. Uh, as you all have said, there's a lot of work ahead of us, a lot of healing, a lot of bridge building that will need to happen in the coming months and years. But uh, thank you for, for all the amazing work um, that made possible today that we're talking about how to reimagine uh, our immigration system. So with that, um, thank you everyone and have an excellent rest of your day.